to start us off, I uh, trolled the, uh, the news groups and uh, tried to write down as many of the objections as I could find. I've got a list of about 30, some of which Conrad I know has seen, some he hasn't. Um, but actually, they sort of broke down into about 10 different categories where there seem to be clusters of similar types of questions. So unless there are suggestions from, from you, then uh, I thought we might basically work our way down this list. But uh, at any point, uh, we're not going to stop for questions. So if you have an objection or a response, then just stick up your hand and uh, we'll run a mic up and you can join in. So hopefully this will be your I mean, on stage I think, and we're the audience. I, I think the main thing here is let's, you know, I, I have my answers, so to speak, to most of these that have come up. But I don't know whether any of you guys agree with them or whether they're valid or not valid or whether, in fact, I'm missing a big point here. I think it's important that we we get clear on some of these, both because we may actually, you know, they may be real objections. It's not to say that they're invalid, or because, in fact, we may not have thought through, you know, the reality of, of dealing with them. So I guess one of the points of this session was to try and think that through a bit more and hopefully come up with some good conclusions for some of those, those issues. Um, should we talk about the basics one first? Okay, do you want to hear one of the typical renditions that this comes up? Which okay. I, I've seen this exact phrase so many times now, from the groups, which is basically, how can you understand what's happening unless you can do it for yourself? It's all just complete mystery if you let the computer do it for you. So, so one question I have about this is, why do people keep saying this about maths? Okay? I mean, in every walk of life now, we have automation. If you're flying an airplane, you can't know in detail how the airplane actually works that moment from, you know... Uh, you know, adjust, you know, you, the various things you're doing. It's all going through computers. It's got various bits of control to it. You can't know all of the things. Why is this such an issue with maths? Maybe people have a, you know, because to me this seems like this is, it's bizarre in a way because you can't control, you know, any machine you control. I mean, it's like <laughs> we're out of the era where if I want to live in a house, I have to build my own house. Right? I mean, I don't know how to build a house, okay? but I still live in a house. I don't know how to you know, build a car or even service my car, but I still live in, in a, you know, I still use a car. So why is this peculiar to maths? We have a comment here. I, I think there are a couple of bad examples out there. So for instance, there are a number of statistical packages for analyzing data. And there's, uh, I can guarantee that most of the people that use them do not understand what they're doing. They're simply going through a workbook and saying, you plug the numbers in here, and you'll, give, you'll get your output. So I think part of the objection is, is that a lot of these tools have not uh, tried to engage the person in actually learning about what the operations really mean. Okay, so I, I agree with that. Now, the, so to me, what that means is, it's like... <laughs> It's almost like the reverse of what's being said, the reality, which is that, you know, people haven't really been trained for a world where the tool is there and you have to use it at some level to get to make progress. But somehow they haven't really been trained to use it. So it's like, That's you know, I, I, I got the keys to the car, but nobody showed me that, you know, how to press the brake pedal because you just kind of went on plowing through people. Or you give a 16-year-old without any experience the uh, ability to fly, or, you know, allow them to fly an airplane with all of its computer systems and, and controls. But, uh, interesting, you give uh, statistics as an example there, because immediately popped into my head was uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient, which shows whether two sets are vaguely correlated. And I can still remember the formula of 1 minus 6 sigma d squared all over n cubed minus n. We might have to and I, that. I, once, uh, I once did that by, well, by hand many times over with different sets. And I'm not sure that knowing that formula tells me anything more about what I'm trying to achieve with that than they not. So no, I am I, using I, it blindly. Every other stats test I use, I don't know what's going on inside. Do I care? I, no, I, I don't think it's quite the same thing. If you look at some of these statistical packages, uh, what you have to be able to do is to understand what package you're using and why. It's, uh, it's a question, and, and that a lot of people don't, uh, can't do that or don't know how to do that. Yeah. I mean, I so think it's, it's a failure of computer education. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I mean, my, my favorite example on that is always, I, I, you know, I don't know why I picked this one, but you know, how many times have you seen people invert a matrix outside education? Mm. Shut up. I, I have never seen anybody do it by hand, not in my whole life. And so to me, you know, and the question is when the, the process of inverting a matrix, a three by three matrix, which I probably can't even remember anymore, what the hell does that tell me? Does that get me to the basics of why I'm applying the matrix inversion? 
And I don't think it does. I think there are basics to do with, you know, why I need to invert a matrix and why a matrix might be useful to me. But they have very little to do with the actual process of what you're multiplying together to do that inversion. And I think that's the key, the key division. It's, it's basics of operating what you're operating, which might be a computer or it might be estimating by hand or something, versus so to speak, the mechanics. It's what you're trying to achieve, the basics of what you're trying to achieve, it seems to me, versus the mechanics. And those two seem to get muddled up all the time, particularly in maths. Conrad, Sorry. you went to a school where the kids are heavily coached to get something like 6A levels. It's a brilliant school. I've spent time there. I totally admire the system and what it does. But you're trying to teach us the maths for having our aeroplane up in the clouds, and we haven't even got permission from the ATC to take off yet. Because when I have a problem in my maths class in the average English school, I might, if I'm lucky, go home and say to my parents, oh, it was a great day today, but I just didn't like maths. And the average response is going to be, doesn't matter, dear, I didn't either. Now, it gets much worse than that. Because that kid goes back to school, and guess what? There are five other kids in class who feel exactly the same, peed off with the whole system. Not just the maths class, not just the maths yeah, teacher, who is now perceived. And now you've got five out of 25. That's 20%. Have I got it right? Yeah. It's, you've got that sort of percentage sitting in class, and according to Gladwell, it only takes 10% who believe something in a community, and very rapidly the rest will too, doubly so if they are angry, upset, and rightly able to complain about the system. Yeah, sure. It works in business, it so, works in math. So those two things work together to totally mean you've got to get the kids on side yeah. before they will fly with you, and then, my gosh, they will fly. John. Let's get back to the matrix inversion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if a matrix is invertible, uh, then um, it's just arithmetic. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting bit comes when the matrix coming from some problem is not invertible, interpreting mm -hmm. that in terms of the original problem. Mm -hmm. Say, uh, a line. Singular matrix or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, and, yeah. yeah and, and, but, uh, but I think it's these. That, and, and the calculating business, I mean, the kid's doing it by hand. Uh, uh, inverting a matrix by hand, 80% of them are going to screw it up. Yeah. By, and, and by then some arithmetic even, error. And, and here's the point about it, that at least I find, okay? Part of the basics of getting, I, I don't know, to me, part of getting to the basics of the thing is getting experience in what happens in different cases. And you get much more experience, it seems to me, if you run down a lot of problems where the answers are, are right, or you get the arithmetic and, and the computation right, than what happened to me anyway, which is I do a bunch of matrix inversions or whatever the hell they are, and I get you know a third of them wrong. And then I get completely confused later, because I can't actually remember that the pattern set in my head as to what was right and wrong gets confused. And so my experience gets turned into something where you know, it's, it's not clear in my head whether, whether this was the thing that was right or wrong. And so I, I, my experience is blurred for that reason. So I actually think, again, you know, one can go much further if one's pounding on understanding getting experience in these steps one, two, and four of my, my four-step chart. And, but one can only do that if one's got time to do that because step three is somehow, somehow with the computer. We should... Um work our way gradually through the list. Let me go on to my next category. Okay, can... you're going to give me one that I haven't seen before. Well, yeah, so, um, so I know you like to talk about the miners' button pushing, so let's go for a different rendition of this, which is um, that one issue with computer-based is that you can set up a situation where you have templates where you know that for a particular problem, it maps to a particular function, and it becomes a very easy, lazy way to recognize this requires calling solve in Mathematica. This requires calling something else in whatever package you're using. And it will just be a pattern recognition exercise in which inputs go with which functions. So what the question is... So the question is, uh, don't you think that's a problem? <laughs> so I should put question marks on the end of all of these, then it would make sense. So I think the question you're asking is, I don't completely understand. I think what you're saying is, is, pa is, is learning to recognize patterns and the fact that somehow a computer makes it Oh, I don't know, easier, quicker to implement the pattern, what you do with the pattern recognition is that bad. Well, you don't necessarily need to understand what the computer's doing, only just recognizing which is the right function to solve it. I don't know, it depends it. what you're, it, de it seems to, I mean, my, my, okay, my immediate response to that, having not thought about it before, it depends what, what you're training for here. I mean, you know, so for example, if you're a doctor, 
pattern recognition is a really important thing to do. And by the way, it's done incredibly badly. Most diagnoses in the world by doctors are wrong. And, you know, it's a huge problem. And particularly as it gets comic. So pattern recognition in that sense is important. Now, there's somehow in maths, you know, if you see a pattern for how something might work and you happen to use a computer to solve that, does that, does that render that sort of less of a skill? I, I don't know. It depends what you're doing with it. It depends whether you're really processing with the answer or whether you're just dumbly doing it, I guess. Yeah, I, I think it comes from a lack of vision for what you can do beyond what you've already been doing. Um, you know, you talk to a teacher who's assigning students homework problems that are basically manually doing ca calculations over and over and over again, slight variations on the same thing. And, you know, you tell them, well, you could, you know, you could be using computers to teach math, and if they don't really, you know, see how much further beyond that they can go, they think, well, then they'll just have their homework done in, you know, in five minutes, and then they won't have actually, you know, worked at anything to learn anything. Because they don't really see how... They don't need, you know, the, the questions that they're asking are the wrong questions, or they're, yeah. they're over, you know, they could be asking so much more sophisticated questions and challenging the students in new um, ways. Um, or, or, or preferably getting, I mean, preferably the students should be asking the questions. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what one, well, that's sure, what one's right. trying I mean, to engender. But the whole, right, the, 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 whole the problem is, is that, but the problem is with this objection is that they're, they're just sort of applying this idea of using computers to solve the problems to, the structure that they're sort of mired in already. See, another and, way to and, put, I think, what you're saying. They, they, they don't see how to go beyond that. No, another way to put what I think you're saying, at least for the computer's dumb math down, which I've thought for a long time is, I mean, it, it's like when I've been shown several times, uh, you know, somebody very proudly showed me how the computer, they, they'd got this nice presentation of a computer showing a student how to solve an equation by hand. Okay? The computer is showing you the steps that you need to solve an equation by hand. I mean, this just seems to me completely nuts for the most part. I mean, it's like it's completely backwards. The student shouldn't be trying to solve the equation by hand. The computer should be doing that. The question should be, why are you needing to solve this equation? What got set up into an equation that you wanted to solve? And what are you going to do with it when it comes out the other end? It's just like, and so I feel often, I suppose, that the real thing that, actually, there are two things, I think, that tend to cause this to happen. One is, Computer is to replace the teacher, not to replace the calculating, which seems like a mistake. Yeah. And that tends to lead to dumbing down, although not always. There are cases around that. And the second thing is closed-ended rather than open-ended. Let's lock everything down. Let's make a special thing just for education that somehow you know, locks it down so that the student can't explore and just do what they want and try and go around. And there are reasons why that happens, but those seem to me two things that tend to cause that result. Okay, up to the top. <laughs> In terms of pattern recognition, I think the same, um, the same theory applies to textbooks as well. Um, now, I'm a bit ashamed of this, but I passed physics just by decoding a book. So I recognized, okay, so here's the formula, and here's an example which shows me how to, sh to use that formula, and then they give me another problem which just uh, reorders the uh, words, but it gives me exactly the same uh, inputs, and I need to take these and put them into the formula, and that's it. So books th do the same thing. They create patterns, and if the kid is smart enough, they don't need to understand uh, maths. They can just decode the pattern. Mm -hmm. Are you also being a bit idealistic in ignoring Probably. the power of laziness here that just as giving powerful software to a student who's being taught a traditional way may cheat and just get the answer, the teachers may use computer-based math as a route to be lazy as well and will simply, by not getting the message, turn it into mindless button pushing? I, I think that, you know, there's, there's great, I mean, things can always be done badly. And computer-based math is absolutely no exception to that. Whether it makes it easier or harder to do it badly, I have no idea. What will definitely make it done badly is the wrong concept as to where to use the computer. That's for sure. But I think that, I mean, I don't know. I think it's an interesting question as to whether, in the end, it's... I, I tend to think, in a sense, but perhaps this is idealistic, as you say, that the more open-ended the thing is, kind of the, the... You either completely fail at doing it, or you kind of have to have a slightly higher level of cognizance to be able to achieve it. I mean, once the thing just turns into a kind of process that, you know, here's what you do, here's what you do, here's what you do, it's kind of, and to some extent it has to be that to scale it up. But to, the more it's that, the, you know, you, you bifurcate otherwise into it's a failure completely, or you've really got to think about it to make it work. Um, 
I'd like to make a point about this one and the previous one, and it probably applies to everything else too. Uh, it's this great uh, legend of curriculum development that mathematics is sequential and topics connect very nicely in a sequence to levels. So this is the topic of that level. Computers can take a high level topic and make it dumb or they can take, they can somehow skip around the basics. It's this whole idea that you have to march the topics in but, lockstep. But, but so you're saying that's false, that they, that's they don't false. go. That's false. Mathematics is not linear. You can take a topic and take it down. I think that's down. a good quote. Mathematics is not linear. I, <laughs> I like the quote. So. Right. <laughs> it, it is a quote. Uh, there, are beautiful, uh, there is a beautiful presentation about it that I love. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, so computers dump mass down. They, make, they change the levels and people resist this idea because yeah, it's mean, against I, their mythology. It, let, let me just say, well, actually, let's have the other comment first and then... I was going to say, there's a great TED talk by Dan Meyer who talks about this issue. And he right. basically says, you know, I mean, you have these questions that have three inputs, you know, and the kids just sort of like take the three inputs and they use paper and they end up with the, the output. So it's a, the same sort of objections she had that, that our current system is dumbing math down. I mean, one thing change? that's certainly, certainly clear about the order and the levels and things, the order of, of, of maths education right now is definitely by computational complexity. What it should be by, in my view, and can be by with computers is conceptual complexity. And that is a big change, and that completely reorders a whole bunch of things. And to, I mean, I still think there is some kind of ordering, because there are certain concepts, even conceptual concepts, that perhaps have to layer on others, maybe, haven't thought about it enough. But, but certainly the current ordering is, is goofy if you're talking about computers. Uh, I think the, this reaction comes when teachers think of asking the same questions. So if the question is, what is the roots of these quad, this quadratic, then yeah, the computer makes that a dumb question, because you enter and you say, oh, five and negative three. I think the problem comes when we have to ask harder questions, and teachers are not qualified to do that, because a lot of teachers don't have necessarily bachelors in mathematics, let alone masters or PhDs, and to ask harder questions requires training and deeper yeah, and understanding confidence. of the material and confidence um, or the ability and time to research what are we actually thinking about here. Um, I think teachers reach their upper limit of asking those textbook questions. Yeah, I, I, I think that's very true. John, didn't you have your example of the, uh, the uh, projectile? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so actually, well, John you did take another question while I find that? Um, yeah. The, um, uh, no, I think this, but you see, again, in the modern world, going back to what I was calling modalities, right, it seems to me, oh, again, I'm, a, I'm an outsider here, for better or worse, but you don't have to have a, a set up with a classroom where it's the teacher knows everything in front of that class, and you have a bunch of students. We have, you know, remote video links these days in, in many places, right? You can have experts who can run thought experiments and things who are expert in doing that. The teacher who's actually on the ground, it seems to me, doesn't necessarily have to be the expert in doing all of these different ways of, of, of getting mathematics to happen. So I think I was talking earlier about how, you know, deploying great new deployments on the wrong subject won't fix the problem. They won't. But I do think there's lots to learn from new deployment opportunities which have not been learned and which could greatly help a change to computer-based maths. So, yeah, so I guess I tackle this one and I write for the company blog. It's a whimsical fun bits of maths. And I, I looked at a question that I learned at school, which is projectile motion. You know, ballistics gun, fires something at an angle at a certain speed, solve the differential equations, get the flight time, get the maximum range. And used it to illustrate this question of dumbing down because there, there were people who would argue that here in whatever it is, six, seven lines of mathematical, I've solved that, and I haven't actually had to understand much other than typing in the equations and Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's sort of dumbed down in, yeah. in the sense that you've just, you've I didn't, just put I it didn't in actually there. have to do any differential equation solving. It was done for me. I didn't have to do any solving. That was done for me. And I didn't have to sketch the graph, so I just get the answer. But my point was then to go on and look at the actual example, and it's, it's dumb because it's oversimplified. The answer is actually wrong. It doesn't match the gun that I was looking up in Wikipedia because it's an oversimplified model. So we're dumbing the question down to make it simple enough to do on pencil and paper. And the rest, you can read this at your leisure if you want. I go and look at drag 
and then put drag into it and you find a completely different answer and then you realize that drag's dependent on air pressure so if you put in the air pressure going down as air density going down as you go up and I threw in gravity gets lower if you're up at uh, 20 miles high as well then you get a completely different answer. But and it, see, uh, and it mean, still doesn't tackle all kinds of things that could be in a perfect model like the curvature of the earth and, uh, and um, I had no uh, Coriolis effect I guess with matter and three dimensional geometry. But you know, immediately you can do much more interesting things, like if the wind's blowing plus or minus 10 miles an hour, how much difference does it make? And right, but in fact, what I remember you saying is you looked a bunch of these things up on Wikipedia, right? <laughs> okay, so you were trying yeah. to figure out, like, what is the drag we should take into account? Well, let's go look it up on the web. Exactly. And my, my thought is that, you know, if you're going to do these kinds of things, then you can't be expected to know a formula like that. And in fact, doing it, I realized that a lot of the intellectual challenge isn't typing the formula out. It's saying, am I looking at a useful formula? What don't I know from this formula? These are the questions we don't teach the students because they're given every piece of information they need. I mean, it's steps. I mean, you know, it's steps like one from the, from the four steps, right? It's like, you know, are we asking the right question here? Do we need to, you know, is the earth curved or is it yeah. flat? Is it, is there, are there winds? Spotting my first answer was completely wrong because I forgot the units. <laughs> so, I mean, related to this same question, I mean, one of the big issues which is brought up, and it's particularly relevant in the developing world, is that the teachers really don't have the knowledge to have open-ended questions. And that is the really big issue. Yeah. And the point is that what you were saying was that um, if you don't have that teacher-led discussion, there's no point. And that's wrong. There is a point, and this is what um, Sugata Mitra has shown beyond any reasonable doubt. Actually, the kids can teach themselves. There is benefit to a teacher, and therefore the role of the teacher changes. The teacher is a facilitator. A good teacher's role changes. And that's what, over time, is going to happen. The role of the teacher will adapt to the fact that the teacher is no longer the source of the knowledge. Look, I think that's a good point. I mean, I know a, here's a parallel thing that happens to us, okay? We have non-technical salespeople sometimes trying to sell Mathematica. And they get panicked about giving a talk. What happens if somebody asks me a question at the end of the talk about hypergeometric PFQ regularized functions? What the hell do I do? Okay? So, you know, it's actually a relatively simple matter of training to explain, okay, here's the way. I mean, I know I've given thousands of Mathematica talks. I know the way to cope with that. I don't know a hell of a lot about you know, hypergeometric functions either, frankly. But I have the confidence to not worry about that, and I know how to deal with that and to help them figure out, okay, well, look, you can look in the documentation. Here's what it is. Let's go look together in the documentation. Let's see what it says. Let's see if we can understand what it says. So there's, I think, a parallel there, it, which I think you're saying about getting confidence and handling those situations as well as being able to move it, move it on. There's uh, one comment that's yeah. been waiting for a while, and then yeah. we'll move on back to yes. the next section. Back to John's mechanics example. I used to teach mechanics... Uh, and the, one of the projects I used was that problem, but where the ball was spinning and the wind was blowing. Mm -hmm. And then you can't solve that without a computer. Um, that would have made it even longer if I had had to look up spin equations. <laughs> That's right. Well, okay. it's, it's um, a, it's a, it's one a, final bit okay. on this, and then we'll... Well, that's good. I Thank mean, you. well, I suppose there is that thing that, you know, contrary to popular belief in the financial world, people are prepared to say, um, I don't know. But a lot of my teacher training was about avoiding the situation where <laughs> I say, I don't know. Yeah. And, and that's, that's quite hard for my older colleagues to sort of actually stand up in front of their students and say, you know what, I don't know. Yeah, I can, I can appreciate that. I mean, I always used to enjoy, the, if, for those who know them, the Feynman lectures on physics. Um, and uh, one of the great things that Feynman said is, we just don't know. We just don't know the answer to this right now. There are a whole bunch of things going around in my head. Um, one of them is a quote, and I think it's Galileo, that mathematics is the queen and the servant of the sciences. Mm -hmm. And I think we, as Galileo, yes? I, I think we have focused too long on math's role as the servant and haven't exposed our students to math's role as the queen. And I think computer-based math, now maybe the computer can be the servant to the mathematics, mm -hmm. and we can teach in a nonlinear way things to our students that we find interesting, that they find interesting. I'm currently into the golden ratio, and I'm staying at the Hotel Indigo in Paddington, and they have phi on the wall, and I'm very happy about that. But, <laughs> but things like those sorts of diversions, that's what makes me happy about math, and that's what I think we don't have the time to teach our students. 
And to the point that our, our teachers aren't well enough prepared to teach, um, I'm now writing curriculum and I have in my head as a mantra, if I cannot find a place in the world where I can tell my students that this topic is taught, why am I gonna teach it? Now, 14 years teaching in, in a secondary school setting in the United States has not allowed me a whole lot of time to look at what's happening in the world in, of mathematics. So I would love to see, and maybe your modules will start this, a library of applications that teachers can go to and say, okay, the syllabus, the, the exam says I have to teach quadratics. How can I teach that in an interesting, meaningful way? Mm -hmm. so, that, that back in, so it's a good, interesting point about that as a transitionary step, having that back indexing. You know, because uh, what you're saying, which I think is interesting there, is you know, we're thinking in terms of let's label modules by stuff you do, and if it happens to bring up solving a quadratic equation, then so be it. That's great, but in the end, but what you're saying is it will be useful once we have those to have some kind of back indexing, saying actually this will be a good example of quadratic equations, even if the topic of the module has, so to speak, is, is quite different from that. That's an interesting point.